Today we're going to look at double integrals using polar coordinates. Now I know this is not a geometry course but many of you who take geometry know what polar coordinates is. It's another way of applying a certain curves where we are dealing with rays and angle theta as opposed to x and y. And double integrals can also be used in that context mainly when we are using polar coordinates to describe region R. Now why is it important? Well, in fact, there's two important uses. Sometimes it's easier to define the region R in terms of polar coordinates. You know, in terms of like circles, sometimes we want to use polar coordinates. And the other one is that to simplify certain algebraic expressions when we are evaluating the iterative integral. You know, sometimes if you see a square root x squared plus y squared, it's the time to use polar coordinates. All right, so this is what we have, okay? This is the um, shape of the curve that we have. Now, many of you know the double integral, right? So basically, what does it give us? Um, geometrically, it gives us the volume bounded between the surface and the region R. So sometimes you want to describe region R in terms of polar coordinates, and today is going to be that lesson and how to, you know, calculate the double integral when region R is described in polar coordinates. Now, some preliminaries, we gotta start simple, just like how we have started placing restrictions on the region R. We're gonna say this is a simple polar region. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, it's conditions for simple polar regions. All points enclosed between theta equals to alpha and theta equals to beta and the two, co uh, two continuous polar curves, R1 theta and R2 theta. So what we're looking at is that the angle theta from alpha to beta is basically over here. The ray that goes from the origin, okay, this is uh, theta equals to alpha, and this is theta equals to beta. Now remember, when dealing with polar coordinates, we go in a counterclockwise fashion from the x-axis. Okay, so you want to see this is basically alpha here, and from here to here is beta. Alright, so we want the points between those two lines, as well as the points that are between R1 theta and R2 theta, where both of them are continuous. Well, yeah, that's what we have over here. So we're looking at the points inside the region R. Now, if it's a simple polar region, we got extra conditions and we need to start looking at these conditions and pay careful attention to them. Alpha will be less than beta, okay, and R1 will be between 0 and R2 for all alpha, for all theta between alpha and beta. So what does that mean? Well, basically, for all angles between alpha and beta, which is these angles over here, okay, um, the alpha must be less than beta. So beta must be bigger than alpha. So we need to sweep out the region, you know, away from alpha, okay, as well as R1 will always be between 0 and R2. Okay, this is in the three-dimensional view. If you want to go into the um, two-axis view, it's basically something like this. Alright? R2 must always be bigger than R1 and alpha beta, uh, sorry, yeah, angle alpha must always be less than angle beta. So these are the points over here. Now, so what is not a simple um, polar region? Well, a, a not a simple polar region is basically we got something like this. And this is say R1. Okay, now as you can see, um, they intersect at a certain point, and this is like really a danger if you want to, you know, or when dealing with double integrals in polar coordinates, this is a danger. They cannot intersect because at this point, you can see R1 is bigger than R2. R1 is bigger than R2. So this is not a simple polar region. Our analysis is restricted to simple polar regions. Now, what's a special case? Well, this is a special case that you will deal with fairly often. That is where alpha is equal to 0 and beta is equal to 2 pi. So what that essentially means is that alpha beta just sweeps the whole region one whole round and it becomes uh, 2 pi. And what is region R? Region R is basically this whole area over here. Now, as you can see, R1 theta okay, is equal to 0. I hope you can see that. So we are going from this point over here to R2 theta. Okay, so it's going from here to here, all those points from alpha equals to zero and beta equals to two pi. The last condition is that beta minus alpha must be less than or equal to two pi. So that essentially means that if I rotate the ray all the way around and go up here. So basically, if beta is equals to, let's just say, five divided by two pi, okay, that's, that is going to be more than two, right? But that cannot be the case. The ray cannot overshoot alpha. Um, the calculations will get a bit messy and basically you're just double counting this region over here so that's not a simple region. But for all cases we're dealing with simple regions so let's just stick with that. Alright, so now we know what a simple region is and we have restricted ourselves dealing when R is a simple polar region and now we want to um, define the double integral in polar coordinates. So this is the situation that we have right here. Okay, now let's just see what do, what can we interpret it from this graph? Well, z is going to be equal to a function in terms of r and theta, so it changes. Remember, in rectangular coordinates, z is a function in terms of x and y. But now in polar coordinates, it's a function in terms of r and theta. So what does this mean? This means if I pick a certain point in r, let's just say the point is over here. There's suddenly a certain angle of, of theta, right? What, what's the angle? The angle is going from the x-axis all the way over here. However, when um, theta is equal to this angle, there are still a lot of points in the region r. Well, essentially, it's these points over here. 
This is telling me I pick an angle of theta, which I did over here, and I must pick a, a value for r. So let's just say if I pick r as this value right here, so r is from here to here, and I put those values inside here, then I get the z coordinate, which is essentially the coordinate over here. So don't get confused, you know, it is a function in terms of r and theta. Okay, so now we are using the exact same process. Now I can pose to you the problem of finding the volume that is bounded between the region R and the surface that equals to the f of R and theta, where um, the function is always more than zero for the region of R. However, let's just go through, you know, because like I said, you know, it has additional meanings, but let's just go through the normal processes and see what we can, you know, get from it algebraically. So instead of using the lines which are parallel to the coordinate the axis, instead now we're going to use circular rays Sorry, circular, yeah, circular rays and basically um, lines that are parallel to the angle theta. So I will divide it like that. Lines parallel to the angle theta, right? And be like this. Okay? Keeping in line of the polar coordinate system. This is what I'm doing now is that I'm subdividing my region R into small little polar sub-rectangles. Okay, it's polar sub-rectangles because after all, that is how the limiting process works. And after that, I will use circular regions. Well, what is circular regions? Circular regions are simply regions like so. Okay, I'm basically just same thing, subdividing the region R, but this time using polar coordinates. So, what can I say about here? Well, uh, let's just define this small little area as small change in AK. Now, this is the area over here. It's not exactly the same as rectangular coordinates because well, it looks like a, a funny uh, shape, okay? It's not like a, a rectangle, but you know, that's just the region that we're concerned with. Again, pick a point. What's the point that I picked? The point I picked this time is going to be R star K, uh, I'm sorry, R K star and theta K star, okay? And what I can do from that is that I can apply the function R K star theta K star to give me the height from here to here to the surface if I want to use my z as the height, okay, and then I can multiply that by the value delta a k. I hope we can see that over there. Now, this is what this is going to give me. This is going to give me basically the volume of the parallel pipe that's going from here to the surface, alright? But, um, I want the whole volume. So I want this whole region over here bounded between the surface r and, sorry, the region r and the surface z equals to the f r and theta. So I'll just basically take the sum, k equals to 1 to n. Sim simple enough, the same limiting process. Oh, sorry, the same summation process. But then again, you all know that there are errors in this approximation. What are the errors? Basically, the errors are the points which are not covered by the polar sub rectangles, such as the, the areas here, here, here. Basically, the areas at the corners, because we know that we can't use straight lines to really exactly approximate the curve, okay, our region R. And then on top of that, like I said, we've got a flat top surface, which, you know, is not an exact value as the curved surface, because it could very well be a curved surface. So what we simply do is that we take the limit as n tends towards infinity, and, you know, all these small little bits, you know, it, the approximation becomes the exact value, and this is what we call the double integral over region R of the function R theta with respect to elementary area A. And that is all there is to it. Basically, the, using the limiting process on polar coordinates to get this definition over here. This will give us the volume that's bounded between region R and the surface Z equals to the F, R, and theta. And then again, just with normal double integrals in rectangular coordinates, um, in polar coordinates, the double integral also obeys the same properties. Scalar multiplication, we can bring that out, and when we add uh, two functions in terms of r and theta together as the integrand, we can basically take the double integral over the, the, the separate function separately and then add them up together. Alright, so this is just the definition of the double integral in polar coordinates. Another name for it is really the polar double integral, but you know, I don't really like that term. Normally, when we say double integral, we mean either rectangular coordinates or polar coordinates by just looking at the situation. What is the situation? How are we going to define R? Okay, and I must say again, this is basically just the con concept behind it. Um, we want to, our objective for the next lesson is to move this double integral, okay, into the iota integral. And I just want to give you a heads up on it. There's an important modification that we need to do to the delta A. Okay? And that lies essentially because of how we have used the coordinate system. It's a polar coordinate system. So delta A needs to change a bit. Okay, so just a short introduction and I hope you tune in with me to the next lesson. Thanks.